out of inquiry from the membership saying the membership would like to know a little more about critical race theory. So uh, CHV's executive director, Judy Berman, got a hold of me and said, you know anybody who could talk to us about critical race theory? And I said, of course, because we have a neighbor, uh, the American Historical Association, which deals with critical race theory issues practically every day, whether it's teaching history in high schools or colleges or grade schools, it, it impacts history and critical race theory has been a problem now with, by my count, since 2020, 36 states have tried to do some piece of legislation that would have affected the teaching of history in our public school systems. So we're really grateful to have today with us uh, James Grossman, who is the Executive Director of the American Historical Association, and Julia Brookins, who is a staff member there. Hey, There's honey, special, let's go. Uh, please mute yourself if you haven't already. And uh, uh, while I've stopped here for a moment, let me say that during uh, the talk that Jim and Julia are going to give us, we encourage you to ask questions by the chat. And after they finish, then we'll open it up for oral questions. But they'll take questions all during their talk uh, in the chat, and they'll be watching, and so will Mary and I. So back to Jim and Julia. Uh, not only are they historians, not only is the association our neighbor, but Jim's experience as a historian largely revolves around Afro-American history and especially in the history of Chicago. And he has been deeply involved in looking at how Afro-American history is taught in the United States. While Julia's specialty is basically Latin American and Latino history uh, in the Southwest. So we have two kinds of specialties here that represent the kinds of history that is contested in our public life. So we couldn't have two better people to talk with us today. And over to you, Jim and Julia. Okay, let me let me start because first let me uh, on be on Julia's behalf a, um, a a slight disclaimer, which is Julia's work, uh, her, her dissertation and scholarship. Uh, it's American immigration history, uh, Germans, Texas, things like that, uh, as well as issues relating to race and ethnicity. And Julia can, I think, probably articulate better than I can what critical race theory is. But before we start, what I want to emphasize is that in the context of the current debate that you see um, described in the newspapers, online, critical race theory is actually a red herring. Uh, what people are arguing about has very little to do with critical race theory. It has to do with politics. It has to do with people being upset that their children aren't being taught the same thing that they were taught in high school. Uh, but that said, uh, Trudy asked us to talk about critical race theory and talk about what it is, and we'll start there. Uh, critical race theory was developed in law schools, uh, and it has been around for roughly 30, 30 years. And is a it, like many theories, is a way of thinking about something much more than a set of facts. It's a way of thinking about the relationship between uh, the law, uh, racism, race, and American institutional life. And I'm gonna that's as far as I'm gonna go, and I'll turn it over to Julia. Hi, uh, thank you all for being here, and thank you for the invitation. I'm glad to be here today. Um, I, I want to also start with a disclaimer, which is that um, neither Jim nor I is a, an expert on critical race theory. And um, it is a way of looking at things, a way of thinking about things, a way of studying things, but it's not central, it's not essential um, to the way that historians do their work. So it, we come across it, we engage with it, but it's not something that every historian does. Um, as Jim pointed out, it, it got its start in law schools and it 
I would say in essence, it's an effort to understand why racial disparities persisted after the civil rights movement and its many accomplishments in making racial discrimination illegal. So legal scholars were looking around and saying, well, racial discrimination is illegal. What's going on? Why are we still where we are in terms of racial disparities in life outcomes? Um, and especially with regard to the criminal justice system and those kinds of um, differences that people experience based on their race. So um, it's a framework for un asking questions and conducting research to figure out why race has remained such a significant determinant of outcomes in many areas. It originated in law schools, examining the impact of laws and other legal institutions, including the processes that make up the criminal justice system and how those impact different communities in different ways. Um, Critical race theory also found fertile ground among those who study education, learning, and educational institutions. So um, these days, you know, sort of, like you said, maybe 35, 40 years after it started to originate, those are the two kind of parts of a university where you're most likely to encounter critical race theory in the education school and in the law school. Um, even uh, the focus on uh, as a framework for asking questions and trying to figure out why race has remained uh, so significant in society. Part of that is to step back and to focus, especially on the when those effects are unintentional. So um, one of the central insights that this framework has offered to people has been that we can better understand racial disparities if we shift the focus away from individual racist people, we shift it away from cases where there is an intent to cause people harm based on their race. And we start looking at, you know, what some people call racism without racists. And that's where the idea of institutional racism or systemic racism has come up. You might have heard some of those terms in this context as well. And I think that's actually one of the ironies about the conflict, the controversies that you see when you see people, when you see these videos of people screaming at school boards or legislators making speeches where people are saying, well, I don't want my, you know, I don't want people telling my kid uh, that all white people are racists, or I don't want people telling my kid or making my kid uncomfortable because of things being said about her grandfather. Uh, the irony is that critical race theory actually moves the camera away from individuals and looks at how institutions operate. So it doesn't matter whether someone doesn't have a racist bone in their body. Uh, they still have benefited from disparities. And, and one of the critical, uh, one of the interesting examples of this, Julie has already thrown out a few, is wealth and why it is that white people are more likely in the United States to have a develop, have accumulated wealth than black people. And the, this has to do with the, um, with the impact of redlining long after redlining became illegal because white Americans were able to invest in homes and see their investments over a period of 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years uh, multiplied by 10, 15, 20 more. Uh, the, house that, uh, the house that my parents bought in 1956, uh, quite frankly, it was not a very wonderful house. It was very inexpensive, uh, but my mother sold it in 1992 for, 10, 15, 15 times what my parents paid for it. And it would have been worth twice as much if the schools weren't integrated, if the schools were all white, uh, but it was in a neighborhood that was mostly white. Uh, this is the white Americans who benefit like my mother did when she sold her house are not racists. They're not doing anything racist but they are still benefiting substantially from the long-term impact of something that kept property values lower in black neighborhoods than white neighborhoods. 
neighborhoods. And another um, another kind of point to bring up here is that it it does it does intersect with the work of historians mostly because critical race theory is one of the ways that scholars in all different parts of scholarship and dis different disciplines it's one of the ways that scholars are trying to understand the various and sometimes unexpected legacies of slavery and racism in America's past long after many Americans had uh, assumed and hoped that we would no longer be talking about the legacies of slavery and racism in America. So um, something like redlining has such a long shadow. Uh, intergenerational differences are being made. Even um, other aspects of zoning law and where Black people or in the Southwest where Mexicans were allowed to buy property. You know, we're talking a long time ago, but this is still, um, it created the foundation that we're living in now. So um, it does intersect with what historians do, but as, as we've heard some historians say, I don't teach critical race theory. I teach critical race facts. So um, I'll, I'll talk about redlining, I'll talk about housing values, I'll talk, but this is not a theoretical framework that historians are often, um, they don't need to rely on a theoretical framework because the nature of their resources, uh, their sources and methods is often not as theoretically driven. Um, but it can what still the, come to the same conclusions. What the theory helped people do was to think about the distinction between laws and practices. And to therefore look, in essence, look at the legal system more critically and say, well, that's what the system is, but how did it actually operate? And that's what opened up all of these doors. Uh, but as Julia was saying, for historians, we quite frankly, uh, Historians don't need critical race theory to help their students, historians, history teachers, to help their students understand the continuing impact of race. My dissertation advisor published in 1961, his first book called North of Slavery, which is all about the legal restrictions in the North before the Civil War and the origins of segregation in the North before the Civil War that eventually became translated after emancipation in the South. You know, the North, Northern states, uh, after they had abolished slavery, created, in, in essence, a, a regime of systemic racism. He didn't call it that. He called it a legal framework. Uh, this was 20 years before anybody in a law school had thought of critical race theory. Uh, so he didn't need that to demonstrate that racism was in essence built into the legal system, built into procedures. Uh, and those of us who have studied the impact of racism, basically what we're looking at is what happened. Uh, but critical race theory entered into popular discourse about two or three years ago because a particular person named Christopher Rufo, uh, a a uh, journalist, a uh, marketing expert, and I believe he was working at the Heritage Foundation at the time or the Manhattan Institute. Uh, and there's an, it, uh, get on your computer sometime and just Google Christopher Rufo, R-U-F-O, uh, and New Yorker. And what you'll see is an interview with Christopher Rufo where he explains how he branded critical race theory as a way of criticizing what was going on in high school social studies classes. He's very clear, he's very, he's very proud of what he did uh, and how successful he was at doing this. And he said he, he wanted to create it as a bucket where you could yeah. throw everything that was wacky uh, that you didn't like. And it has been successful, unfortunately, at that. So whenever people encounter something that they consider outrageous in education or related to race in society, they could say, ah, there, the, there goes the critical race theory again. Um, so it's, it's, it's been, as Jim said, very successful. It, um, it's successful also in part because it's three words that are scary to a lot of people. Individually, the words critical, <laughs> race, and theory. <laughs> 
you can invoke any one of those and you can scare a lot of people in this country. So when you put them all together, it can be terrifying to some people that this is what's going on in the schools. The other thing is we've done a little bit of work starting to think about what was taught a generation ago or two generations ago. And what's being taught in high schools now is not what was being taught uh, in some cases a generation ago, in some cases two generations ago. And if you wanna get a sense of how scary that is to most people, this is a, one of the things I like about this group is, is I'm comfortable with popular culture references. And if you think about Tom Lehrer's new math, uh, which was this, uh, you know, that, that little song he did about the, the horrors of the terrors of the new math and how, how scary new math was to parents uh, back then and still is. When my daughter was learning math, we had no idea what, what they were teaching her and why. This catches on because it's something that makes parents uncomfortable. But math, at least, it made parents uncomfortable that their kids were learning how to divide in ways that seemed weird, but it didn't bother them politically. It didn't drive at who they are. And so if you just think about how parents got upset about their kids learning math in a way differently from how they did, imagine how that translates into history. Uh, that your kid is learning that all the heroes you learned about weren't really heroes. Uh, all the processes you thought were wonderful really weren't quite so wonderful. It's very disconcerting to parents. So if you take the scary three words, the intentional creation of the bucket that Julia described, and the political valence that you have when you can scare the hell out of people, um, Basically, you get critical race theory in the schools. And then that was added to by the publication of the New York Times 1619 project, uh, which even more exploded assumptions that people had learned. And what's interesting about the 1619 project is that like any other work of history, it's something that somebody put out there. Some of it's better than other parts of it. People argue about it, and in 10 years, the textbooks will re reflect the best parts of it and will have dropped the worst parts of it. Uh, and yes, it's kind of odd to say the country was founded in 1619, but it's not odd to say that the origins of our social and economic system might well be rooted in what happened in 1619. It's not a long jump to say, well, instead of founding, let's just talk about origins. Uh, so there are ways in which one can debate and use what they argued in the 1619 project uh, that are much more constructive than the kind of fear mongering that the anti-critical race theory uh, movement, I guess, is the same way to describe it. One way to frame this in ways that might be easy to pick up is that one of the things that people who have been very critical of 1619, justifiably, uh, it has to do with the revolutionary generation and the origins of the founding documents, the founding fathers. And what they've argued is that the founding father, and this goes back again to critical race theory, that to call the founding fathers a bunch of racists uh, is insulting, it unpatriotic. Uh, it's also quite frankly, not very useful. But if we step back and say, most of the men who wrote the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution were men who owned, bought and sold people, that's a fact. That's not critical race theory. That's a fact. If we start with that fact and say, therefore, that, that they considered this to be a reasonable way to live, probably affected the way they thought about themselves, their neighbors, and civil order, which therefore would have influenced the documents that they wrote. 
I, I grew up in a certain environment in a suburb of New York. Uh, no doubt that has influenced things that I've written all my life. It doesn't mean it shaped it, but it influenced it. Each of you grew up in a certain environment. Uh, we, we, we learn from the world in which we live. So to argue that these people were not influenced by slavery and by racism just makes no sense. You don't need critical race theory to say that the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence were largely written by people who owned, bought, and sold other people. Where do we want to go from there, Julia? Um, oh, well, I think one thing about the 1619 project, which we've mentioned you and I together as well, is that while it's definitely um, inspired in part by some of the insights from critical race theory, the structure of the argument is a little bit like the opposite of critical race theory. So critical race theory puts the focus on institutions and the purpose for many people who do it is to say, well, we made this system work this way. Let's think about how we can remake it so that it works differently. Let's find a different path. Let's change our processes. Let's change our assumptions. Let's tinker with the law, tinker with the way our school systems work and try to get a better outcome. Whereas the 1619 Project in its um, framing in the, the, the foundational analogy was that the United States was born racist and would stay racist for the rest of its existence, which is not, as I said, the same sort of um, move that most critical race theorists would do, uh, because a lot of people are motivated by a, a, um, a desire to make the world better. And so you have to at least think it's possible to do that. And for many people in the law schools and in the education schools, people teaching K-12, whatever, that desire to make things better means looking carefully at where these differences are happening and trying to um, disentangle the, um, the disparate outcomes from what's necessary. So you say, oh, well, we have this policy. It has this impact that we don't like. What is it about the policy that we have to keep? And what is it about the policy we could change to get more equal outcomes? Um, a fairer system. And that I think is very different from the um, kind of storm and drong of the 1619 projects um, kind of framing that, you know, there was a ship on the coast 400 years ago and we've never gotten, we've never really gotten off the ship. Moreover, with whether it's critical race theory or people who have written about anti-racism like Ibram Kendi, uh, their argument is why would we go to all this trouble if we didn't think this couldn't be fixed? Uh, Kendi, in fact, has talked about, he's a cancer survivor. Uh, Kendi wrote How to Be an Anti-Racist. Uh, what's the name? The first book, Julia, was- um, I don't remember the name. Or um, Stamped from the Beginning which was, again, an argument about racism emerging in 1619. And he has been one of the people who's been cited as saying America is hopeless, uh, that they are um, fundamentally unpatriotic because they've said that, that America's racism cannot, well, the stamp from the beginning implies that, uh, perhaps an unfortunate title. Kendi's, what Kendi has said very publicly is, hey, look, I'm a cancer survivor. Uh, you think I would be spending my life uh, that I have left, that I never thought I would have, uh, talking about this if I thought it was hopeless? And the people working in critical race theory, in fact, were trying to draw attention to systemic racism in order to demonstrate that all solutions were not psychological, but were rather sociological and legal. That Even administrative, way. like yeah. you literally have a policy about, oh, this is how we do our reimbursements. Oh, wait a second. Our reimbursements are working better for some people than other people because of the way their finances are set up. You know, even just like down to that real detailed level, um, looking at how things operate. 
and administration. And that, that's, I think, partly why it's been the legal fields and the education fields that have really glommed onto it um, is because they kind of see themselves as having careers where they can tinker with a little bit over here and a little bit over here and try to try to get things on a better path. Actually, Julia, that, that's a really good one. The reimbursement system. <laughs> uh, I mean, this is an example of how theories don't give us answers, but theories help us to ask new questions. So if you've been reading critical race theory and you say, okay, uh, I need to look at outcomes rather than just procedures being equal. Well, reimbursement procedures are the same for everybody. So there's no inequality there. There's no racism. None of the people who are, who are uh, tallying up the forms, processing the forms, writing the checks, they're just bureaucrats, they're not racists. Uh, but if the, uh, I'm trying to think of how to do this now. If your reimbursement procedure requires that you use certain software and the computer scientists in our midst said to us, well, because of differences in wealth, differences in residence, and differences in, say, type of education, uh, more Black people used this software rather than that software. But the reimbursement system requires that software. Nobody did anything racist. But yet you have a procedure that has differential outcomes according to race. And once you realize that, actually the solution becomes rather straightforward, which is, oh, why don't we let people use either software? Uh, or why don't we think a different way of doing it? We have a question in the chat. Um, who's saying hopeless? Okay. Uh, hopeless has been the people who have been writing the legislation. If you look at the legislation in, and in the 40 states in which it has been introduced, I mean, the reason why this is a controversy right now, quite frankly, is that in roughly 30 to 40 states, there has been legislation introduced to prohibit the teaching of critical race theory and to prohibit all sorts of other things. To Jim, I have an example. I was just looking at it. I have it uh, open in another tab. Excellent. Okay, it's um, one of the things that's prohibited uh, by one of these bills that's being considered in Colorado, and th there, there are a lot of different versions of it, but they often have similar uh, provisions. This one says uh, it's prohibited. Uh, this will prohibit um, teaching that Colorado and the United States are fundamentally and irredeemably racist or sexist. Um, and that's where people are saying that, but the people on the other side aren't, that's not really what they're teaching. They're not saying that the United States or Colorado is irredeemably um, racist. They're just saying, hey, this might not all be going the way we want it to. And what's interesting about this is you could then say, okay, nobody's saying the US isn't irredeemably, is irredeemably racist. And therefore we shouldn't worry about these laws because they're prohibiting things that nobody's doing. The problem is that for a teacher, there's a certain chilling effect because you're not sure whether someone is gonna accuse you of that. And if someone accuses you of that, you've gotta hire a lawyer. You've gotta worry about your job. Uh, you've gotta worry about whether someone's gonna throw a brick through your window. So there's a certain chilling effect, even though you're prohibiting things that nobody is doing. There's also what's a push poll effect in a sense. You may remember that push polls are when, uh, especially politicians, they do polling and they ask you questions in such a way as to make you think something is true, even if it's not. Uh, it's the sort of, you know, um, the, the do you, do you, when did you stop beating your wife kind of question. Um, if you pass laws prohibiting things, people will begin to think that those things must be going on. So the law that Julia just read, the, the bill Julia just read, uh, when people hear that their legislators are introducing that legislation, they'll assume that what's being prohibited is being taught in the high schools. 
Uh, there's another question here. Doesn't a resolution of CRT bring into question the yes. meaning of equal? So yes, yep. I can, I'll let Jim take that one first. Uh, it, it, it actually gets you to the distinction between equality and equity, which is fraught, which is complicated. And quite frankly, you can fall in, depending on the context, fall into different places. But basically, treating people equally means treating everybody the same, which sounds just fine. Uh, equity has more to do with looking at the outcomes. And what you often have to do is say, OK, if we've treated everybody the same, why aren't the outcomes the same? Now, in some cases, that could mean that some people aren't working very hard or aren't trying very hard. But in some cases, it could mean that the very procedures that you have somehow skew a process in one direction or another. Uh, here's an example that's not race, actually. Uh, if, you, if, you're, if you're looking at first-year college students taking introductory courses, and all of the introductory courses have a very heavy first week because the first week establishes the foundation for the course. And all students are gonna to have to work hard that first week to get everything right. And then they can move on in the course. There are a group of students who have jobs and a group of students who don't. The group of students who have jobs are less likely to do well that first week because they're still trying to figure out how to coordinate work and school. There's a group of students who have children and a group of students who don't because we increasingly have first year students now who are in their late 20s. That first week, they're trying to figure out childcare and the, others, the, 20, the 18 year olds aren't. So there's a group of students who grew up in families whose parents went to college and therefore, in essence, know how to do college. And there's a group of students who have no relatives who've ever been to college. And so this is all new to them. So the procedures are equal. Everybody's being treated the same. But when you look at the results, and there's very good data on this, the group of students that fall into these other categories uh, First generation students, students with jobs, students who have children, they do poorly on introductory courses, which then leads to high attrition rates. Nobody did anything on purpose. Everybody was treated equally, but the outcomes are unequal because the circumstances are unequal. So that's that's one way of talking about the difference. And it's it's not um yeah, it's not that everybody is going to try to remedy this, but certainly I don't think most people would want to get in the way of those, uh, whether it be college administrators or student affairs people or whoever, who are trying to help the students navigate the differences they have and how they're encountering college and how they're experiencing that first week or the first courses or whatever. We work with a, a, a group of people and, and uh, they work on these types of retention and other issues with um, college students. And they found in one of their cases, they couldn't figure out what was going on with this one course section, why everybody was late or no, the working students were always late. Um, the students who didn't have cars were always wait, late was actually what was happening because the bus didn't arrive until 10 minutes into the class time. So when they figured out the bus schedule, the professor was able to adjust the course in a way that it was in fact treating students with different backgrounds more fairly, even though that meant making a change to what that professor would have done otherwise if that person had not investigated, why are these students always late to class? Um, so they're even, you know, at a lot of different levels, some of these differences are very small, but you have to pay it a certain kind of attention. And it's paying that certain kind of attention that I think has been the best contribution of critical race theory. Um, and then there are other aspects of it, which I think have been more controversial and maybe there's not as broad a consensus about those interventions, those changes that they're recommending 
being for everyone. So um, like any other field of study, it's there's people are complicated and they pursue different research agendas and find, have different findings and different interpretations of what they do find, so. I think one of the difficulties that people have, which is one of the reasons why this legislation, this anti-critical race theory, anti-divisive concepts legislation is attractive to some people and why some people get scared when they hear that this stuff is being taught uh, as American history is that there's a certain comfort level in thinking that the civil rights movement solved all the problems by changing the laws and making the laws requiring that everybody being treated be treated equally and not seeing, and this is where historians come in, that for historians, it's not quote critical race theory. For historians, it's context. That context always matters. And that two different, two different, that things that happen equally over here and things that happen equally over here have different contexts and therefore are going to have different outcomes. Um, oddly enough, Malcolm X uh, put it, had, had a really uh, nice way to put it when he said something along the lines of being able to sit at a lunch counter does not make you a diner. Being able to afford a hamburger makes you a diner. So the law might have said, well, everybody can sit at the lunch counter. But if the law is not accompanied by change that allows everybody to be able to afford the hamburger, then in fact, not everybody has access to what that what can happen at that lunch counter. Uh, I, next question, Julie, did you want to? Well, I was going to say, and I think that's where some people start to see what they call socialism or um, something that's maybe a little bit more ominous for them when they think, oh, well, these people are saying that everybody's outcomes have to be the same in order for us to rest and enjoy the fruits of our labor or whatever it might be. Um, but I don't think it needs to go that far to see um, plenty of work to be done in continuing to improve um, race relations in the United States. There is a question, do you wanna read it? How does CRT, critical race theory, interface with affirmative action? Does affirmative action translate to trying to treat everyone equitably? Let's, let's stop there before we do the rest. Um, that's a really good question because I, my understanding is that critical race theory emerged in part as part of the conversation with affirmative action policy. Uh, although affirmative action policy goes back to, um, goes back to Nixon actually in the, and the construction industry. Uh, that's one thing that people have forgotten. That, that, that it's Richard Nixon who introduces affirmative action. Into An unlikely protagonist in that story anyway. Uh, that's right. That's right. And I think it's because Nixon actually truly believed uh, in markets and everybody having a chance. And that was part of what affirmative action originally was about. Uh, it intersects with critical race theory in a way by thinking about outcomes, which is Affirmative action does say that not everybody is, should be treated the same, that an affirmative action employer goes out of their way to hire and retain uh, minoritized populations. Uh, what that means, for example, it, it doesn't mean hiring people less qualified. One thing it means is if you have two people who are equally qualified, you hire someone in an affirmative action category. But it could also, for example, mean in educational context, uh, you're doing college admissions and you have uh, candidates who are um, members of populations that have been previously discriminated against. And you say, okay, we can admit these five people, but it's gonna take this much extra work for us to bring them up to where they need to be by the second semester freshman year. What affirmative action is telling you to do is admit them and do that little extra work. Uh, in essence, what affirmative action, at least as originally construed, was 
to do whatever you can to bend over slightly backwards or more than slightly backwards to admit, hire, promote people who have been discriminated, who, who have been discriminated against in the past. The assumption being that it has not been a level playing field. Um, and I think critical race theory would, would, I think the original affirmative action maybe was a little bit more simplistic. And if anything, critical race theory right. would have given more texture to that to say, it's not enough if you're admitting the 20 kids, you do actually have to do that extra work or you're just admitting 20 kids. And then if they do fail, they're gonna feel like it was because they had some deficiency and you weren't able to help them feel that they belonged in that college. And so doing a lot of work on uh, what it takes to help students feel like they belong somewhere is a big part of what people, especially in the education field who study uh, critical race theory, end up doing is working on these sort of what can sound to an outsider, uh, slightly weird sounding programs or like, wow, do they have to do, if they have to do that much to get them through the college, why are they bothering is sometimes the reaction. But it really is about helping to make all the students feel like they belong at the institution. And that can require work in a lot of different um, parts of the, of the school or the college. And there's a way, I mean, there's also a way in which affirmative action is completely separate from all of these issues. Uh, we have always had affirmative action in our society in other ways. So when my daughter, older daughter was applying to college, uh, I was especially interested in reading about college admissions programs. And there was a wonderful article uh, where the admissions, Dean of Admissions, and I think it was Amherst in an interview did kind of a tell all and explained what their system was. That every applicant was graded on a one through five the fives were automatically admitted. The fours were the ones that they had long conversations about. And the threes were admitted if they were hockey players. Uh, we all know that this happens in colleges and universities all the time, whether it's, I mean, there's another place I'll, that will remain nameless where my younger daughter was applying, where what they told us was it wasn't just sports. That, the, that everybody who did something special in the university had a little doorway, in essence, in the admissions office. If the cellist graduated and the, um, and the director of the college orchestra uh, was doing things where they really needed a high quality cellist, he could go in and say, you've got a cellist in this pool uh, who is really special I've heard her play, I know she's special, and if she is qualified, nudge a little bit, please. And the soccer coach could do the same thing for the goalie. That, that basically this kind of way of thinking about a more holistic approach to choosing people who we admit to school, who we hire, we've always done that, and it's not a bad thing. Uh, we've never done things on single qualifications. So I think affirmative action also needs to be seen that way, which really has nothing to do with critical race theory. Uh, it's a whole different thing. Um, in the chat, uh, strikes me that one of our largest social tensions revolves around the reality that we are a country that has real difficulty finding common ground when it comes to deciding to make change versus preserving the status quo probably no different from any other country. Unfortunately, those who have the power to set the structure are likely not the folks that are disadvantaged by the current one. Also probably not unusual. Uh, one of the things that we think about a lot as historians in terms of the common ground is that a lot of these laws that are being proposed what they're doing is they are telling teachers, you can't teach about division. You can't tell students that our country has been divided by race. They call that, they refer to that as a divisive concept. They tell teachers that they cannot, um, that they cannot emphasize in their class discrimination against women, discrimination against gays, discrimination against Jews, doesn't really matter. Uh, that teaching quote divisive concepts uh, is, is, is not permitted. 
what we've tried to argue about history is a medical analogy. If you go in to see a doctor and that doctor doesn't try to figure out how you got sick, how you got wounded, the, in essence, the etiology of your, of your condition, that doctor is not going to be able to heal you. And in history has the same set of issues in terms of, I think, this comment about common ground, uh, common ground and making change, which is that you can't heal divisions until you know why they're there. And knowing why they're there requires that you teach the history of lynching, that you teach the history of slavery, that you help students understand that the founding fathers were people who owned other people, that differences in wealth have to do with redlining, uh, that there are people who are still alive. Uh, one, of my, one of my good friends and someone who Julia knows as well, he could not go to visit his parents with his first wife when he was young because his, he could, but anytime he went to visit his parents with his wife, he was violate, they were violating the law because interracial marriages were illegal in the state of Virginia until 1970. You carry that through your life. And if our students don't understand that that's what life was like in the South for 80, 90 years, there's no way that we can heal the divisions that come from that. Because students won't know why the divisions are there. And critical race theory is one set of questions that helps us to understand the persistence of those inequalities. Jim and uh, Julia, you've got a couple of hands. Uh, Peter okay. Stein has been uh, wanting to get in, Carol Gratkins is. So let's start okay. with Peter Stein. Absolutely. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I was late for your presentation, but what you said was very enlightening. Uh, Julia, you said uh, in in passing, that students have to feel comfortable. And it seems to me what was left out of your discussion, Jim spoke about, you know, the difficulty of uh, carrying out affirmative action. My question is, to what extent are institutions prepared and have in place social policies and personal support for students who are admitted under affirmative action. Very specifically, I taught at Douglas College, which is a women's college of Rutgers. They uh, admitted 24 young African-American women, primarily from Newark and Jersey City, who came from, uh, you know, uh, economically disadvantaged families, but the young women were very bright. Each student was assigned a faculty advisor, her own, and a senior or a junior student. We had weekly meetings. We did a summer seminar for them. Uh, all kinds of issues came up. So it wasn't only how will I, will I do in Sociology 101, but how do I get accepted as a student in an all-white institution with virtually no minority faculty at that point, uh, you know, it's, 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 I think, a much more complex issue than a legal ruling. Yes, we'll have affirmative action. We'll have more Hispanics or Ukrainians. It, it's more complicated than that. And that, I think, was always one of the most compelling critiques of affirmative action um, was that it ended up setting up a lot of minorities and people from disadvantaged backgrounds for failure at at whatever opportunity it was that they were supposedly gaining access to, um, that the access didn't really count as real access because the supports weren't there. And um, I think that people have gotten a lot more sophisticated in thinking about that. And um, there are a lot more people working on that now than there were even when I went to college uh, 25 years ago. But um, but the to the extent that different institutions have different 
resources allocated for that, I think it still makes a big difference. Even if people in the administration or the faculty understand these differences, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to give the faculty mentors time and support to engage in that mentorship. It doesn't mean they have the resources to make sure that the, whether it be counseling or whatever it is, is actually being provided to these students. So it still varies widely, but the thinking is a lot more in line with what you're describing at this point, I would say. Thank you. And Jim, and Jim, yeah. Uh, go to Carol Grodzins. We've only got about eight minutes yep. left, if you don't mind. Nope. Um, just first of all, Jim, you reminded me of something when you started, or even when Trudy introduced you with someone who's worked on Chicago, which is my hometown. And um, I just, I remembered as you were talking that in 1958, my uncle Morton Grodzins wrote a book and supposedly was the first person to use the term white flight because oh. it was a book about what was happening in Chicago and brought up all kinds of in. So this is a partly, you know, I didn't know what he was talking about. I was eight, but uh, <laughs> it was, it was uh, I remember the term and then hearing later. But the other thing is about if Kendi is, a, a, is some people say hopeless, although Jim gave us a reason why he's not, um, we were having a, um, a road trip with my kids and my grandchildren. The grandchildren go to public school here on Capitol Hill. One is 10 and one is 12. And their mom brought along the audiobook Stamped, which is a children's version of Stamped from mm. the beginning. Mm -hmm. And I, listening to this, was shocked. I was hearing things I never knew about history. I was hearing ideas and challenges listening to this book. And my grandkids were all, oh, yeah, we, we've been reading about that. We've talked about that at Watkins School. And um, at the end, I asked them, well, you know, I've heard people say, oh, you're making children feel guilty, guilty for who they are and all the things that you both have described um, off and on. I, I, so I asked Hank and Zadie, I said, you feel, you made, you feel terrible when you, are taught these things or do you feel guilty or bad about yourselves and interestingly my granddaughter said well first of all i'm not totally white because she's already <laughs> heard things about none of you know those who think they're white um and 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 then she said no you know uh, what it does is it makes you which is what the the audiobook said um robinson i think is his name who wrote stamped he said, why am I telling you kids all these stories? It's so that you can grow up and do something about these systems. So I have found it really um, ed yeah. educational for all of us, but also hopeful and inspiring to change our country. That's all. I think that uh, you're absolutely right, Carol, that, that a lot of the rhetoric around this in some ways is underestimating students that your grandchildren are not the malleable pieces of clay that these people worry about. And for anybody in this room who's had children, if you remember when they were teenagers, the wording in the legislation that Julia was reading, if you read this legislation carefully, what it usually prohibits is indoctrinating students. It's really hard to indoctrinate a teenager, really hard. <laughs> And so this notion that there are these teachers indoctrinating students, uh, I think part of the problem for people is people want to be good people, they want to do the right thing, and when they find out that what they're doing is discriminatory, regardless of their intent, it is very difficult. And that's what a lot of what critical race theory is saying by looking at outcomes. One very easy example of this uh, is gender in engineering schools. If you have, or not just engineering, in science, in STEM disciplines, there are many men, I think we all know, who think that women are more organized than men, more trustworthy, more skilled at interacting with people. What that can translate into 
in a STEM lab situation is the very few women students that there are ending up in essence doing the administration, running the lab for the advisor, doing less science and more administration, working with the budgets, helping other students. That could mean that their research suffers. So the person, the, the person who's running that lab, the man, senior, senior male, all-star STEM scholar who's running that lab, in fact, is not discriminating, doesn't believe that women are inferior, but because of certain notions of the difference between men and women, he's screwing every woman who passes through his lab. And this is the kind of thing that critical race theory tells us to look at, because you can't see that unless you look at the outcomes, unless you look at 10 years worth of data on research uh, accomplishments of men versus women. Uh, you have to end up looking at the data on the outcomes. And this is, this is what this kind of approach in general tells us to do, is not just look at people's intent, not just look at the level playing field, but let's look at what actually happens. Thank you. One thing that two of you haven't mentioned is the impact on our growing Latina population, Latino, Latina population. Um, has critical race theory uh, impacted that at all? And if so, how? Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, in all of these places where you're looking at different outcomes, <clears throat> certainly um, collecting the kind of data Jim was just referring to, it requires disaggregating populations by sex, by ethnicity, by race, um, which some people don't even want you to do that. They don't even want you to disaggregate the outcomes so that you can see this, so you can start to ask the questions. And that I think is part of the issue with Latinos and Latinas is that um, they're not always as visible in the data that we see. Um, and a lot of it, like in every other question, a lot of it depends on the specific context. So the history in the Southwest versus the history of say Puerto Ricans in New York, those are two very different histories and the places where you're going to see the racism are not going to be the same. And the outcomes you're going to see are not going to be visible in the same ways based on really very specific local histories. Um, it has not, um, there, there are some who argue that the category Latino, Latina was actually created as a marketing category by businesses attempting to sell their products to this group of people that they were they had in mind. And so they actually, through um, active efforts and marketing, tried to create a more unified um, Hispanic population so they could sell Hispanic products to them, where the people themselves didn't necessarily see that much commonality in their histories or their situations. So um, as a historian, it's very complicated. In terms of critical race theory, yes, um, it can also help see where there are disparities in um, the systems that are intended to serve those populations as well. Well, Jim and Julia, thank you for a wonderful hour. We're right at five o'clock. We promised we'd end in an hour. Thank you both very much. I'm sure that all, I speak for all of us saying it was an enlightening hour, that's for sure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And if, if anyone has a question, a follow up question or whatever, you know, our emails are available and we read them. So um, feel free to send us a, a question or even if it's just a comment or story that didn't get in today. We even answer them. <laughs> <laughs>